And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Geek Watch, a subsidiary of the monastery, the open bar of the internet. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have my good brother here in the temple, the man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadari Enterprises, and the bane of my fucking existence, good brother Xanatrix. We are back We are back once again, and for this, for this one... We haven't talked about RTSs in quite a while, if at all, on the show. And while I, while we could talk about Warcraft or, or Starcraft or even a bunch of others, um, it'd be a little too easy. Plus, we already did the whole thing dunking on World of Warcraft, so I don't want to double dip into that. And um, I have something else in mind when it comes to talking about Starcraft. Which is why today we're going to talk about the inspiration for those games, technically. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah, it's kind. It is kind of funny that the, that um, that the the games that the games that inspired those, um, and the and the company that makes that makes said games on both accounts of tonight. Are getting a repu have been getting a reputation for their litigiousness. Their so, overzealous litigiousness that, d that doesn't even have any basis. Yeah. So let's talk about Relic. In the early days, the thing that Relic was known for was Impossible Creatures, which is a game that I've heard about plenty of times and haven't played. But I think for a lot of people, they're they're going to be most well known for the Company of Heroes games. I've gone on record saying that Company of Heroes is a gold standard when it comes to World War II RTSs. Oh. And just World War II games, period. I know some people will cry... I know some of the Hearts of Iron um, Turbo Nerds were cry foul about that, but um, I, was ne I was never huge when it came to Hearts of Iron. A little bit too calculator-y for my taste. Yeah, number crunchy. Mm. I understand. I understand that there is an appeal that there is an appeal with number crunchy, but sometimes the number crunchiness just just amounts to thing go up. Yes, yes. Sometimes that is really all number crunch becomes, and it's sad when that happens. Mm -hmm. I mean it. As much as as much as people make the spreadsheet jokes when it comes to something like Eve Online, at the very least the there's way there's ways to do the num there's ways to do the number crunch and a lot of the spreadsheet shit is more player inflicted. I mean, they're literally tracking economic trends within a one of the earliest metaverses to use a term that's going around like fire that people don't actually understand go read snow crash you fucks mm -hmm. um but <laughs> they're 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 tracking what is essentially an entire independent economy in order to game it um is there no sec in eve online <laughs> i'm pretty sure some of the care bears would want one but not to my knowledge uh, I, I, I'm mostly joking. There's no need for an SEC when you have pirates that can crash millions of isk. Mm-hmm. Oh, just remember, the best ship is friendship. <laughs> Unless you're the guy making friends to steal their ships. Oh, that heist is infamous to this day, and I love it. <laughs> However... For this, I know that oh, for this one, but but that is getting into the weeds and getting back on the rails. I want to talk about a, I want to talk about a game series that, for me, for me was instrumental in bringing pe in bring bringing new people into the gr into the grim darkness where there is only war. Because this week we are talking about Dawn of War, a tale of two playstyles. So, 
Now, one might ask, didn't you guys blacklist? Don't didn't you guys blacklist Warhammer 40k? We blacklisted Games Workshop, but when it comes to games made on that made on that IP, we're not complete. We're not completely blacklisting it. The only thing we're blacklisting is not 3D printing every goddamn model because fuck you, GW. 3D printed models can be better than some of your own quality, as Commissar Gamza has demonstrated. Mm -hmm. also, and for you know a fraction the price. Yep. And for and since he's started putting out guides on on um on three on just what kind of 3D printer to buy, there's e there's even less barriers, which I'm sure angers the buttermilk bobs something fierce. Oh yeah, he's actually started putting out like full on STL libraries. Uh, you have to you have to pay into his Patreon at fifteen bucks a month, but he's like. But for that, you get what would be equivalent to thousands of dollars from GW. And I'm like, you know, he ain't wrong. And I know some people will talk. So will talk that he's not that he's not factoring in the resin. Um, you can get resin dirt cheap. Resin or filament, depending on your type of printer. Though, I would definitely recommend resin for these types of minis. Mm -hmm. Um, but essentially. While we have a, 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 a an everlasting hate boner for GW right now because GW is full of bullshit, mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean we can't talk Dawn of War because Dawn of War in many ways is fantastic. Well, I do think that well, I do think that there are too many that there are too many Warhammer that there are too many Warhammer games nowadays, as it as in as in there's no real quality control. I cannot deny that there's that there's been plenty of good games with using the IP in the in the video game space and to a certain to a certain degree the role playing and tabletop space because I already I've already talked about the um, role play books that were do that were done by people like Fantasy Flight Games and then later on and more and more currently um, Cubicle Seven. Yep. And a brief period with um U with Ulysses get with Ulysses um spiel, but. I already talked about that in the in the Wrath and Glory video. Mm -hmm. So, with Dawn, but with Dawn of with Dawn of War, um, I would have I would have loved to have gotten a behind the scenes look when it comes to the pro the process of get of of get of Relic getting the license. Especially, yeah. especially, especially given some of the bold moves that they had done. And there's one that I th there's one that I think we have to address right out of the gate, because you look at a lot of um, 40k games that have involved these Spes Marines, and there's a handful of chapters that they always fall back on. Usually the Ultra Smurfs. <laughs> it is mm. nine times out of ten the Ultra Smurfs, and. You, Blame Matt Ward for that one. Yeah. There are there are rare ex there are rare exceptions. Um the uh, the old the old Arm the old um Armageddon game that used epic rules um was more was more of a grab bag. Um and of and of course um more recent stuff like Hired Gun as jank as it can get is is certainly not using Space Marines, and then there's Fire Warrior, but I'd rather not talk about Fire Warrior. Yeah, we don't need to talk about Space Communist. Oh, uh, it's not. It's not even that. I'd rather not talk about a game that had that had some of the worst had some of the worst bullet spread I've ever seen. Yeah, because they were trying to spread bullets to everyone equally, Monk. They were trying to be a Halo killer, Monk. Why? Why you got to kill the communism joke? Why? <laughs> oh wait, I know why. You're you're the Stalin in this case. No. <laughs> I am not. I am not going around with a mustache. Fine, you can be the Mao in this case. Fuck you. <laughs> But uh, no, Fire Warrior. Fire Warrior is very terrible. Do not play the game. If you're that curious, just go watch Mando's review on it. 
If you're that curious, you might be better served pouring bleach in your own eyes. However, however, with with Dawn of War, they made the they made the command decision to not focus on any of the more popular um, Space Marine chapters, and instead built instead build their own in the form of the Blood Ravens, or as I like to call them, the Crows with Attention Deficit Ushiny. <laughs> which is certainly the case, and it it is a bold it is a bold move to do. It worked it's, out though. Yeah, it wor- it worked out. But I could don't I the but that's the reason why I'd love to have been a fly on the wall when it came to the pitch because I could easily see them go going we have to ma- we have to make a new we have to make a new chapter with with an with um with our, with um with a new co- with a new codex possibly and try and have it fit within the lore of of 40k. I imagine that there were probably some people at Relic who were big fans of the tabletop that knew h- how easy it was to make a codex compliant uh, new chapter mm-hmm. since it was built that way, you know, baked into the actual war gaming uh, war game itself. And uh, some of the, some of the things that they did were a, were a smart move because. As I as I understand it, and I may be getting the details wrong because it's been a while since I double checked on some of these. They are they, it is what founding they are, is not known. Their um pro, their progenitor, is not is as far as where their where their gene seed comes from, is never has never been stated. But a lot of people speculate that it, that it was that. That it was um, Thousand Suns. Um, a lot of people speculate it was Thousand Suns, but then, it, then of course, all the blood iconography. Many people also speculate Sanguinius. Um, I don't. It would be hard. For, it would be hard for it to be Sanguinius because you never hear them talk about either the Red Thirst or the Black Rage. Well, but a lot of uh, second and later founding. Uh, descendants from the original Blood Angels uh, further and further and further dilute that out until the Red Rage or, or, or the uh, the Black Rage or, or any of that um, basically doesn't exist for those later chapters. Mm-hmm. And truth be told, not going into those was was a smart move because then you'd have to explain all of that and it's going to paint your um, new cast in a di- in a much different light. Yeah, uh, this is one of those cases where we've where we've said in the past, things that don't need to be explained don't need to be explained, and explaining them only raises more questions. This is this is one of those cases of it's just not explained that thing. They don't need to be explained to be a kick ass chapter mm-hmm. that steal. I mean. Uh, appropriates art of historical artifacts. They're Indiana Jones, monk. Yeah, and <laughs> the, of course the, of course the other um, one of the big reasons why a lot of people speculate thousands, thousand sons is due to the fact that so many, uh, so many people within their chapter are psychers. I mean, flavor. Yeah, but the the point is, the point is um, there's been plenty of times where so, where um, somebody jumps onto an IP and introduces a new character, a new character within it, and that new character ends up not doing well. So it's a risk that can happen. Yeah, but again, like I said, because of the way that the new chapter founding stuff in in the actual war game was baked in. Uh, I think they ran less risk doing it than they would have it otherwise. Although, um, it would be fun. It would be funny as hell if at if at one point they wanted to get the lamenters and they were told no. <laughs> <laughs> which you can just which you can just add to the at to the long 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 list of lamenters' misfortunes. It's Probably. okay. Some, somebody will create a, their own custom uh, heraldry and, and color pattern to put the Lamenters into the game because of the color edit. Oh, yeah. 
Um, some pe some people d have done really good things with the army painter in the game. Some people have done horrible and terrible things. Um, I'm part of the latter class. <laughs> I am both of them at once. I think everybody is. You start out making something relatively serious, and then you make something dumb. I I can't claim to be both. I'm sorry. I just went straight to making something dumb. <laughs> It was also uh, eye-glaringly bad, so <laughs> my opponents, the few the few times I would play, you know, multiplayer, would uh, would be like, the fuck are you marching with? I'm like, do you not like them? They are glorious in their magnificence. Often I would get rage quits just from the way my army was painted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think, wh I think what's... What I what I find very in, what I find very interesting with with um the with the combat loop that we started to see with Dawn of War is twofold. One is the is the group based approach, as well as as well as equipping whole groups and being able to change their equipment on the fly, which is something that something that I think a lot of other um other RTSs weren't doing. Yep, just cost you a little bit of requisition and, and or power, and all of a sudden now your squad of, of marines or whatever had a new, brand shiny new weapon. Or a brand shiny new chaplain. <laughs> the, uh, the other thing, of course, being a far more aggressive design. Yeah. Because, because, of, because of how... Every, Everything is built around control points. The only people who could effectively turtle were the MP guard, to be honest. Because they kind of had to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but even the, but um, with with the first Dawn of War, even the, we didn't ha we didn't have full on MPs. We had um, PDFs. Yeah. Which um. PDFs are de are decent are decent at policing actions and and the like and not much else. More often than not, they exist to get curb stomped by the invader of the week. And for those of you scratching your head at what the hell PDF is, because your only uh, uh your only understanding of PDF is a file type it stands for Planetary Defense Force. Think of them as the National Guard, in equivalent to the Imperial Guard being your army and navy. Mm-hmm. So, even less trained, even less uh, material, even less arsenal. They're they're just kind of equipped to make sure the planet doesn't fall for now, and then, uh, you know, they're they're basically meant to be a holding action and a meat grinder until the big guns show up. Those big guns usually being one fucking battle barge, and then the enemy shits their pants. Mm-hmm. And when it, I should I should note that um the the trailer that we all saw that kind that kind of referenced the kind of battles that we'd be seeing, and the importance of getting that getting that flag on the hill. Mm -hmm. Um. That was that was a classic case of another studio handling handling um those handling those sort of cutscenes. I can't remember the company. I I keep wanting to say it was it was Blur Studios, but I'm not 100% certain. I'd have to go look it up myself. I I could probably find out by mm -hmm. booting up the game and looking on the credits page, but but what I what I always find kind of amusing is a, a lot of people treat various RTSs um as um as a glorified tutorial for the multiplayer. Whereas, if I ask people, if I ask people about um, about Dawn about the original Dawn of War and even the expansion packs, a lot of them will a lot of them will talk about the story more than more than anything else. Because the campaign mode was fucking insane. Even very early on in base Dawn of War, the the campaign mode was uh was very robust. Mm -hmm. But, I mean. Obviously, it's r super fleshed out in later, in later games, especially the last two expansions, especially, especially Soulstorm. 
Yeah. And you sh and of course there's pl of of course with, within the core gameplay loop you you only for all for all intents and purposes before things started to get added you only had to worry about two resources requisition and power. And of course of course we could we could go into base building and tech trees, but that uh, but um, that would be getting far too in the weeds. That would be details, forest for trees for territory. Very mm -hmm. true. But the key thing I w the key thing I want to focus on within that campaign is the story of Gabriel Angelos. Oh man! Which um, on one hand, G on one hand um. I love I I love the I love the character. On the other hand, there's a few things within it that don't exa that don't exactly gel. And mm -hmm. uh, you can kind of blame CS Goto for this. Who's not he's CS Goto is not the worst writer in the in the Black Library. Yeah, that's that, that's uh that's um especially reserved for a man who has a special place somewhere in Kamara named Ian Watson. Mm -hmm. However, the, he has his infamous moments of stupid. I mean, all of the authors have that at some point, but his are pretty big. One of them being that he was a that he was a PDF soldier before he became a space marine, which he would have been Does way it? too old to be a P, to be. He would have been way too old to be a space marine by that point. So. Side note to anyone who doesn't understand why one person can't just jump for for. Planetary Defense Force to Space Marine. Space Marines start when they are children because they have to be both genetically and hormonally altered and given a series of approximately 31 implants over their their equivalent to puberty to become a Space Marine. Um, without this, you can't become a Space Marine. Mm -hmm. So you can't go into the military first, then go be Space Marine. That don't work. No. And he, and I, I get the I get the feeling he looked I would have I would have said that he looked at the um the the um Spar the transit the transition from Spartans but even even then Spartan Spartan 4s weren't weren't a thing until years later. So I don't I have no idea what CS Goto was thinking. I think I know. I think he was thinking a normal military where you can have uh, someone do well in reserve forces go into active forces because of how well they do. I, I almost guarantee that's what he was thinking. Uh, if only because that's the only thing that makes any goddamn sense in the mindset, not in the in the world lore. <laughs> Still makes no goddamn sense in the world lore. <laughs> yeah. Now, when it comes to, but what? But even even with that, the I'd say I'd say the sto I'd say the overall story the overall story is a bit of a, a bit of a grab bag, but Gabriel but Gabriel is. Most certainly, the focal point. Someone trying to do his job while still dealing with um, his own his his own past demons. In this case, that being um, the f the fact that he ordered exterminatus on Cyrene, which was well, I mean, for the for the morality of the universe, what he did was completely justified. And I I do appreciate the fact that he even even after all the, even after all the time that's passed, he it exactly what exactly what the details were that that um caused him that caused him to call on the Inquisition are never stated. Especially since most Space Marine chapters hate working with the Inquisition. And the feeling They're... is usually mutual. Well, that's because the it, the. Uh... The space marines are so close to being mutants; they might as well just be wiped out. The Inquisition can protect humanity itself. It, it, to which, you know, Logan Grimnar and the Space Wolves laugh in their faces. Mm -hmm. But because, 
And of course, there's also the there's also the fact that Astartes operate under a degree of autonomy. That th that that they can, that the Inquisition can't just bar can't just barge in and and accuse and accuse um, them of being mutants. Mutants, heretics, Xenos, they try, and then ranks close, and they're like, you have to let us investigate. No, we don't. We've done our investigation. They aren't what you are claiming they are to be. Well, we can't trust you. You can't trust the Emperor's own? It's That is always how the argument goes. Mm -hmm. You can't trust the sons of the Emperor, the Emperor's own? Really? You're claiming that you cannot trust these beings created directly by your god? Mm. Mm. Man, the Inquisition has gotten backlash for that more than once. They deserve every bit of it. Oh yeah. Now, the now when now um, I'd say the I but the other half the other half of it is that throughout throughout a good chunk of it there's there's a bit of a um a bit of a a bit of a dynamic between him between. Um, Gabriel Angelos himself, and and his and his his de his de his dear friend Isidore. Mm-hmm. Um. And of course, some, of course, of course, throughout that, then we at first. This is the this is the way that these things always work. It seems it seems like it's a case of one race fucking things up, then you dig a bit deeper and you see that other factions are fucking things up as well. So and, the 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 fortieth millennium in a nutshell. Got it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the, and that's how we get that's how we get chaos and Eldar showing up. Oh. El and as a. You all know my hatred of elves, and Eldar are no exception. In fact, I'd say they're the biggest example of everything I hate about elves. Except for Eldrad. Eldrad is always cool. But that's also because Eldrad is a dick. <laughs> There's always a bit of dickery when it comes to elves, but Eldrad is a dickery class of his own. Most, uh, most, uh, most elf dickery... Is Dickery in the we, in the we are better than you, but we refuse to prove it kind of way. Eldrad will continually prove it by ju by just be by just having the just as planned face. Yes, um, Eldrad's the guy who's like, I am better than you, and I can prove it, and I have proven it, because you fucking monkeys don't listen to me. Like he's legit tried to help the Imperium on more than one occasion. And uh, they don't listen to him, so he's like, "Fuck it." You you even see in hindsight that my that my advice I gave you at the time was valid, and you could have used it, and yet you still say, "Nope, can't trust you. You're Zeno." Fuck it. I'm better than you all. Eat shit. Here's my dick. Now suck it. Oh, let's let's <laughs> also not forget that he he is the kind of person who would, as as T, as T G has pointed out. Give out candy to lesser races laced with a deadly gingivitis virus, and just so, just so, just so that when they inevitably get eaten up by the Tyranids, the Tyranids get that same get that same virus and get wiped out just before they were about to attack his craft world. And what would Mister Ulthway himself say? Just as planned. But with but getting getting back to getting back to the heart to the heart of the matter, I think the other thing that cer that certainly helped is the fact that outside outside of Blizzard, you didn't see this level of effort when it came to voice acting in an RTS. Um, yes, a lot, of, and I I'd say a lot of I'd say a lot of um I'd say a lot of PC games around that era. Oh, uh, and. I will I will admit that the that the highlight for me is um is ba is Bale and Sindri, especially Sindri, but voiced by Scott motherfucking McNeil. <laughs> and Rhinos Rhinos Enemies hide in metal boxes. The fools, the cowards We should We should take away their metal boxes. 
Sindri! <laughs> we'll get, we will get to Soulstorm later. But get the memes to- are plentiful, my friends. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and so, something that definitely helped is because the is um the work is the work of one YouTuber named Big Dick Cheney. Yes, I know. <laughs> because well, as much as as much as I love um the campaign of the original Dawn of War, there is one there is one weak there is one weak point in how cutscenes are in how cutscenes are set up. It's very mm-hmm. clear that it's using the same game engine and. Sometimes it can result in cutscenes not having the same impact. Plus, the um, the soundtrack is very much a battle soundtrack. The problem is, is that it is that it's a battle soundtrack with without, without much variety, I guess. Which is what, which is why I, which is why I find it, I um, find it amusing that um, BDC had. Re- had redone the had redone um the soundtrack to use tracks from things like st- things like Star Trek, MS Igloo, Wolf's Rain in one case. Good soundtrack with MS Igloo. Mm-hmm. Terrible OVA, but uh we won't get into that. Yeah, that's that's a story that's a story for another for another day. And of co- of course um of course Mordecai Toth. Um mm-hmm. as probably the most reasonable inquisitor that we that we've seen in a while. Other than um, pre-radicalism, Eisenhorn, yes. Well, Eisen- Eisenhorn's a special is a very special case, considering that he has a- his own personal demon. Literally, yes. And as as an as- as an aside, um, the best way to describe Eisenhorn is what would happen if an in- if an Inquisitor was a hard-boiled detective. It's a good book series. Go read it. Mm-hmm. Now that be that being said, when it comes to the chaos end of things, it's supposed to be Black Legion, but then you have but then you have Sindri talking about blood for the blood god, which is which um creates its own bit of problems because Corn despises sorcerers. Yeah, Sindri saying blood for the blood god doesn't quite make sense. One could argue that he's that he's supposed to be chaos undivided, but you look at you look at the way you look at the way he carries himself, he does not come off as that. He com- he comes off as very Zinchian in his, in his methods. I mean, you have to have another justice planned dick to try and counter counteract Eldrad's justice planned dickery. Mm-hmm. Two big dicks swinging, as we would call it. <laughs> oh yes. Um. And of course, of course, of course, even though Sindri, de- even though Sin- the the other key thing that you see in a lot of campaigns with um with forty k is. Even if the bad guy dies, he still manages to find a way to win. Yeah, because in the grim future of, uh, uh, in the grim and dark future of the forty-first millennium, there is only war. Until it comes, until it comes time to advance the story, in which case there is only bullshit. Monk, we're not talking seventh, eighth, or ninth edition. But we, but I would, I would say, I would say that with, Dawn, I will admit that I got into, Dawn, I got into Dawn of War a little bit late. Um, in fact, it, in fact, it wasn't until it wasn't until, um, I caught, I caught wind of people of some of the videos that Big Dick Cheney was putting out that I started to delve into it more. Mm-hmm. Um, specifically, <laughs> specifically the opening cutscene for dist- for um. Um, chapter four, destroy the Xenos. Yeah. Oh. Um, I will. I will say that. I will say that. My the str- the um. That when when it came to when it came to multiplayer, um. You de- 
you definitely had you definitely had the th you definitely had the basic three set up. You have your all rounder in the form of this in the form of the Blood Ravens. You're mm -hmm. more specialist in the form of the Eldar, and your horde guys in the for in the form of the orcs. Um, yes. From what I recall from multiplayer with just vanilla Dawn of War, Chaos really hadn't established itself. <laughs> it was ju it was just a reskin Space Marine by that point. Yeah, Ka Chaos was just. Space Marines, but edgier. Mm -hmm. Which is saying something, because Space Marines get pretty edgy. And while while Imperial Guard shows up in the campaign, technically, again, they're more like PDS than Imperial Guard. Yeah. There might be I some... Mean, they are, Go ahead. Uh, they are part of the Imperial Guard. All PDFs technically are. Um... But like I said, it's a, it's the situation of uh, reserves and national guard versus actual active duty. Mm -hmm. But um, well, apparent apparently, even with that, it ended up doing ended up doing well enough to start getting expansions. Three three of them, in fact, and two out of three ain't bad. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I don't really want to talk about Winter Assault. Can we skip Winter Assault, please? <laughs> I think we, I think we kind of have to because it was the last uh... one that was a, it was the last one that was an attempt at a story idea, a full, yeah. because Dark Crusade and Soulstorm weren't doing the same type, weren't doing the same type of story setup. They weren't. They were doing a better type of story setup for this game. <laughs> But instead, they decided Winter Assault. I I I liken to them to them trying to be a little more Warcrafty. Yeah, but it's also I hate I hate to put it this way. No, I, I actually I really don't. No, I kind of do because I I like Dawn of War so much. Hmm. Um, Winter Assault. Uh, Winter Assault is. Rather than being bad, forgettable. I think the I think the pro I think the problem is, and it is an issue of stakes. It doesn't really establish a good a good set of stakes. There's really no pressure. There's no there's no pr there one there's no pressure and two is is the fa is the fact that. You would you would think you would think that since it's in, you would think that um it include including a a um or a order and a order and chaos storyline would mean would mean that would mean that you would focus on on a, on a faction from each from each side but instead we have this hod we we have this hodgepodge where they're jumping around it would it be weird of me to say that it kind of makes the same character jumping mistake that um, camp that campaigns in the Nether Realm or Mortal Kombat games have done. Absolutely, that's actually really good comparison. Because think think about this, with the good with the good arm um, with the good campaign, the Order campaign, we end up jumping around. We end up jumping about between Imperial Guard, Eldar, and Space Marines. Which is funny that the Eldar are included there amongst two human factions because you know, he, the Imperium of Man is not known for being the most accepting of uh, Xeno, Xeno life forms. Mm -hmm. They have an entire branch of Inquisition, Ordo Xenos, meant to stomp out aliens. Mm -hmm. Granted, granted, certain infamous aliens are. Um, are far more deserving of getting stomped out. To qu to quote Inquisitor Adrio Quist, where are the gene stealers? <laughs> However, the whole, you would one would think one would the I'd say the big problem is is the case of you have two sides fighting over a fighting over a glorified MacGuffin. In this case, said MacGuffin is a Titan. A imper a imper I think an Imperator class Titan. Which is funny. Where are they going to get a Titan crew? Where are they going to get a Titan Legio? That's my question. Mm -hmm. That's like, one, that's one of those things I don't I don't think they can, I don't think they considered. 
because it's not it's not like you can just ha it's not like you can just um just su just salvage the thing and tow it. The titans are fucking huge. Imperator class titans are the hugest. They're hundreds of meters tall and crewed by scores of men and protected by thousands of skitari. Mm -hmm. Titans whose arm cannons are used as fucking anti... You can't even say anti-fortification. Anti-planetary weapons. Mm -hmm. Like they, they, they take out entire cities in a shot. At least they would in lore on tabletop. They're much less impressive. Mm -hmm. <sighs> and there's also, but there's also a case of been there, done that with se with several of the with several of the characters. Um, when it comes having, having a having a having a um ba a battle hardened um chaos warrior. Along, alongside a more scheming sorcerer, even if even if the um, roles are not exact, not exactly the same, a f a far a um, arrogant farseer, and the and unfortunate unfortunately, the guys on the box, the Imperial Guard, kind of get over kind of get overshadowed in the story. Of course they do. They're the Imperial Guard. Like let's let's be honest here, Monk. The only time the Imperial Guard do not get overshadowed, even in the later expansions, is if you're playing them. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, um, they put up a good fight, but they die. They die good too. Mm -hmm. Now, the f that that being said, some of some of the can, some of the later missions can really be, especially on higher difficulties, can really be a death march in terms of difficulty. They can really be a dick move in terms of difficulty. You'd think Eldrad was the one making them. <laughs> and I can I can I can certainly under, I can certainly understand that the I think the reason what. I think the reason Winter Assault doesn't doesn't stick or doesn't stick around in a lot of people's memories is because of the fact that it didn't qu it didn't quite do what it need it didn't um it didn't do a whole lot to stand out. I mean the the whole thing of two sides that have to unite against a bigger threat. We've seen this done a dozen or so times with with Warcraft already. Yep. Oh, we and we even saw this. We even saw that in the in the final act with the original Dawn of War. Yep. So the the thing is the thing is is that Winter Assault was trying to be more, but not but also trying to be different, and could and couldn't ba couldn't spin both of those plates. I doubt either of us could. And I don't spin plates. I don't spin plates, and I wouldn't want to. That sounds like fucking hell. I get the feeling that Relic under had understood that had understood that that um, wasn't going to be tenable, given what they would do next with um, Dark Crusade. Ah, <sighs> the introduction of that fucking campaign map. I love that campaign map. Holy shit! Mm -hmm. So. What they did with campaign mode in Dark Crusade, and which would later be even further expanded for Soulstorm, holy shit, they introduced a campaign map, and each campaign was different depending on who you chose to fight it as. Um, you'd start in a different place, you'd have you know different units, you'd <clears throat> get different war gear upgrades for your HQ unit, uh, essentially a hero unit that you started every map with, so long as it was the map that uh, they were stationed in that was getting attacked. Um, and it, each one had a different reason to be there. Like, it was given to you by a narrator in the introduction. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but the best part is, moving around this battle map, you had to fight whoever had the space you were moving to. And so you'd have your 
one your your one army versus one army war uh until you got to certain special spaces um spaces with either different boons different upgrades that either made you get you know forward operating bases so that you could put down some base units in a space you were going to move to so you had some of your tech tree to start with mm -hmm. or um the one the infamous I, and i do say infamous because getting those servitors was fucking stupid spaceport map um which gave you the ability to fly around the whole map and drop in on any space instead of moving to the next adjacent space um and then of course every opponent had an hq space which if you got to you'd get a story cutscene in engine which it's fine story cutscene in engine was just fine mm -hmm. um you'd have to fight on a specialized map that usually had some specialized uh circumstances and then uh you had to get to their main hq destroy their main base and usually that was the end of it and that would just eliminate them outright from the running. Some of their spaces that they had taken over would still be there, but they'd have no actual hero unit moving around taking new spaces. So people would just move in, take those spaces for themselves, and eventually they were completely 100% gone. Mm -hmm. um, but, for example, I believe it was the Imperial Guard HQ had the Maelstrom Cannon on it. And so your your issue was moving... Your units up a you had to move your units up a specific pathway to get closer to their HQ, but every like I think it was five minutes the maelstrom cannon would go off, and if you were in that lane, they just all died. Mm -hmm. And the maelstrom cannon is an Imperator Titan weapon, so this is a weapon that fell off a Titan and they repurposed to use as a giant defense gun. Which... This is much more realistic than repurposing a whole Titan. Yeah, which they. They had kind of done this with the Titan, with the with the Titans cannon in um, in Winter Assault, but here it makes here it makes more sense, and you're able to reuse assets without it being bullshit. Mm -hmm. um. it's, essentially, this uh, this campaign mode, um, it did story mode right because it was your influence that would determine who wins the conflict and thus what the outcome of that conflict was. So there's no, there's technically no legitimate canon end to that conflict. Um, I know many will argue it's likely the Space Marines ending. But I know that in the uh, description in Soulstorm, it's a, it's like mostly the Space Marines ending with a couple of things from other factions endings kind of mixed in. Mm -hmm. um, it, it also properly made the Imperial Guard feel like the Imperial Guard. I, th I think in, I think I think in both Winter Assault and then with Dark Crusade the um, branch of the Imperial Guard that they used was the Cadians. <laughs> Why would the Cadians be somewhere other uh, other than Cadia, though? For the for those who don't understand why Cadians being anywhere other than Cadia doesn't make sense, Cadia is the first and last bulwark in front of the Eye of Terror. Mm -hmm. It's the place that keeps all of the fucking warp shit from coming out into real space. Yeah. And while the while the Imperial Guard were certainly playable. I'd say I say with Dark Crusade, this is where a lot of factions really start really started to with some of them at least started to get their particular game their particular play style far um far more in, far more in line because yeah Imper um I'd still I'd still say that e that even throughout all this Space Marines are still meant to be this jack of all trades um archetype mm -hmm. orcs are still the horde guys. Yep. Um, Eldar are still specialized. I'd say Ka I'd say Chaos Space Marines started to get their identity a bit more here, but I I can't recall the details because I didn't play um, Chaos as much. Yeah, um, you started seeing more of the of their um, demon units. I'm pretty sure. 
Yeah, that that was that was the big thing, and of course the of course the whole chaos undivided. Yeah, and and the the reason demon units are so good, uh, they're deep strike units that you can just teleport. Mm -hmm. You have some demons queued up. Okay, teleport here in the middle of a fucking firefight. You want some horrors here? Have some horrors. Take some fire. Literally. Yeah. And the, th of course, and of course, on the, of course, on the commander, you had, um, you had the, ba you had the badass that is Eliphaz the Inheritor being at his, being at his absolute best. Ah, uh, Eliphaz the Inheritor. Um, everybody should look up that channel, because there is someone with an Eliphaz the Inheritor channel. Um. I would say that the owner of that channel embodies LFS pretty, pretty well. Mm -hmm. Completely batshit, and it makes perfect sense. Um, but the... The meme of all memes, um, Farseer Maha, part of Dark Crusade... Oh man, if you if you ever look up Farsi or Maha memes, you will you will see that everyone calls her an eternal virgin. <laughs> it is hilarious. Of course, Winter Assault spawned the other infamous meme. Tell me, Monk, can love bloom on the battlefield? <sighs> it was a well-written story, but a giant fucking meme. Um, I just I just love that a meme had, ended up making it into something official because the the assassin in that story has a has a cameo in the in one of the um one of the Dark Heresy books. Yeah. Yeah, he does. The Vindicare Assassin, L-I-B-I-I. Mm -hmm. Which isn't even proper Roman numerals. They were trying to stamp him with a serial number. It would properly be L-V-I-I-I for 58. Mm -hmm. um, and if they were trying to go for a Hitman reference of Agent 47, that should have been X-L-V-I-I -I for or for 47. Or, but, you know, um, beggars can't be choosers. The, uh, uh, the, the big thing here is that Dark Crusade introduced a lot of the elements that would popularize Dawn of War 1 and its expansions um, greatly. Yes. Dark Crusade is is Dark Crusade is definitely where I started to hear a lot more buzz and hubbub amongst the less war gamey uh, hardcore crowd uh, concerning Dawn of War. The other th the other thing to note is the fact is the fact that one could while I don't completely agree with this simply because the scale doesn't match up, but the f but the f it's very, it's very, int it's very interesting that they leaned a little bit into um, grand strategy without being full grand strategy because the map isn't nearly big enough. Yeah, um, and you, you could even say that about the campaign map um, in in Soulstorm. It's bigger, but it's definitely not like Total War Summit I two bigger. When I th when I think of big ass campaign maps for a grand strategy game, the one I always think of Crusader Kings. Oh, of course. Fuck. I realize that's low hanging. Fr I realize that's low hanging fruit, but if I can't if I can't use that, I'll bring up um, Total War Rome. I love Total War games to a point. Uh, Total War Rome was was good, sort of. Some things were pretty jank. Mm -hmm. But that's neither here nor there. Yeah, we we are not here. We are not here to rag on Total War right now. 
be a geek watch down the line we should do though yeah i'd probably call it an i'd probably call it an exercise in frustration <laughs> but uh the the other ones are um all the unique uh powers that not just, not just powers, but the introduction of war gear, a war gear that you could have your commanders equip, and mm -hmm. um, the honor guard. Yes, the honor guard units were the other big thing about about that. If you conquered any of the non super special places, um, and even some of the super special places, you'd get a unit that you could spend planetary requisition on. Planetary requisition being a resource generated by per turn by how many spaces you had taken over um in order to give yourself units at the beginning of a of a of a fight and these were stronger than most normal units of the same type um additionally this this could be used at the forward operating bases uh which could also use planetary requisition to f place down buildings and other normal units to fight. So, all in all, you you could really start doing some, frankly, dick strategies on the campaign to uh to so many of the of the AIs. AIs did not like me. AIs did not like me. Even on the hardest difficulty, AIs did not like me. I think I think it's quite telling that some of the mods that I've seen have been for retooling the AI. Yeah, probably to make the game a little more challenging and or fair, uh, depending on who you were. Mm -hmm. Now, the best mod for Dark Crusade I ever saw, which I think actually influenced some of the development of Soulstorm, was the Witch Hunters mod. And the Witch Hunters mod added in the Sisters of Battle as, as a faction, the Inquisition as a separate faction, and I think demon just demons by themselves as a third as a third faction. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is this, the reason I think this influence Soulstorm will be obvious when we get there. But yeah. uh, like they had things like. Custom-made models for things like the Penitent Engine were <laughs> fucking great, um, and it was it was one of those things where holy shit, more armies. Sure, you can't use them in campaign because the campaign can't really be injected to that easily, but holy shit, when you're playing multiplayer, a skirmish or something, or you know even a CPU skirmish. You can play the fucking Sisters of Battle, or you can play the Inquisition, which had some... They had Grey Knights all to themselves. Fucking Dread Knights everywhere. Fucking baby carriers. Uh, it, it, it was... Like, like I said, the best mod that I had access to at the time. Yeah. However, um... This is also this was also the start of the start of the um, of what could be considered the Scott McNeil show because <laughs> the amount of the amount of named and un and unnamed um, voice credits he started to have in the Dawn of War series got ridiculous. I'd say how ridiculous? I'd say borderline Mega Man cartoon ridiculous. Where he's talking to himself among four characters. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I wonder if they just took full on takes of him talking to himself. I do know uh, TJ Omega had had a clip in his in his old Mega Man review of um Scott of Scott at um I think it was at MetroCon talking about talking about how um how the others would be like, Oh, Scott's got one of his scenes coming up and everybody would just everybody would just go out for coffee and he'd be in there by himself. <laughs> That's a good way to drive a man insane. And he he ends up he ends up joking about voices in his head and I'm like yeah that that sounds about right. Uh, well, I mean like like I said, good way to drive a man insane. It's a good thing Scott McNeil already was. <laughs> I, I love um... you, Scott. I'm, I, that was no hate. It was all love. <laughs> You're completely insane, and I love it. They came like the last 
When I was there a few years ago, when he when he was there, they gave him his they gave him his own entrance to Thunderstruck. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, just be, but of course, of course, the last time I spoke with him, he kept he kept bringing up the voices that he did for D and D Online because my reputation preceded me. At that point, you go. Have you done any other online games based on TTRPGs besides D D D? No, th this, <laughs> which I can certainly understand, and yet, and yes, he d and yes, there were tall jokes made at my expense. That's why you make small jokes in return. One could even call them petty jokes because they're so small. <laughs> yeah, but he, he isn't that much shorter than me. Monk, what is our rule? If they are shorter than us, then they are short. Fair. Have to, <laughs> I will have to amend. I will have to amend that if I see him again. <laughs> that is our one rule in the Tall Guys Club. If they are shorter than us, then they are short. Mm -hmm. How, however, I as. As much as as much as I love Dark Crusade, I'm not I'm not going to sit here and say that say that it's perfect. It was certainly the closest to it, but there were there were certain there because of because of the because of the fact that we have let's count them one two three four five six seven factions. Uh, some uh, uh. faction some faction um some faction setups. We're go we're going to be a bit we're going to be a bit skewed. Yes. Um. um. And I, f if I'm being if I'm being honest, even though even though they were introduced and they're on the friggin' box, Necrons were, not were kind of were kind of dull to play. They they were lacking compared to what they would eventually become. I believe the Witch Hunters mod also had some side stuff that added to to their roster. So. You know, they were fleshed out again by the modders. We we love modders. Thank you very much for making some fantastic shit. Mm -hmm. The I think the big I think the big problem is the the theme with the Necrons is supposed to be a slow a slow descent into death, which is hard to do in an RTS. Yeah, they uh, they certain they I'd say they succeeded, but maybe succeeded a little too well. The pro the problem is when everybody. The problem is the because of that slow descent, they didn't have enough unit variety to ju to justify their setup. The Tau, I think, fared a, fared a little bit better, even if even if um even if a lot of a lot of even if the Tau just felt like a slightly gimped version of IG. I mean, remember the Tau can't fight in melee. This is not the far side enclave. <laughs> <laughs> Which, as as an as an aside, you, as an aside, it's all it is um fu it is funny to me that I think this was around that time when Games Workshop was really trying to push the idea of the Tau as the quote unquote good faction, the greater good. That's all I can ever think of when I think of the of the Tau. Which again then immediately makes me think of Simon Pegg. Mm -hmm. And. Hot Fuzz is a great movie. I'd, I'd the big the big problem was just was just that when you compare the amount of unit expansions the and the variety the variety of approaches that some of the other factions could get is even even though even though I've talked about how Eldar are typically the specialist unit and orcs are, and orcs are your orcs are your um snowball faction. That doesn't that doesn't mean that all roads lead to Rome when it comes to how you go across the tech tree. Yeah, I am. Um, I remember the very first time I played Orcs and got their their ultimate tech that made Slugga Boys free and also no pop cap. Mm -hmm. And I remember crashing the game on my computer at the time by just setting all of my barracks to spawn Slugga Boys, reinforce the Slugga Boys, and send them at the enemy camp. the 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 side of the map that I was on was nothing but green dots flooding towards the other side. Um, 
And then the game was like, yeah, fatal error, bye! I was like, oh. You mean I can't actually be orcs? Sad face. Mm-hmm. And... But the, but even even within that, the other the other classes the other um I keep saying classes the other factions didn't get didn't get as much didn't get as much variety and it may, and I have to wonder if they were put if they were put in pretty late into production. I I think it probably was the case um, that Necrons and Tau were put in late because they're like we probably need more factions now that we're expanding it again and. Well, what are two of the popular factions right now? Tau and Necrons. Tau from the Games Workshop side, Necrons from the player side, because Necrons have always been, holy shit, very popular. Mm -hmm. um, everybody likes to be space terminators. Don't forget that. Especially when you have a rule that you just roll some D6s and have guys pop back up. Man, I have fucked over one too many people during, in the war game using my buddies' Necron armies with my dice luck. Mm -hmm. They do not like the fact that half of a squad that they just killed pops up right in assault range with them as they were moving. <laughs> like, oh god damn it, and then they die because, well, Necrons. Mm -hmm. I mean, the t the suppo supposedly that supposedly the idea with the Tau was that they were supposed to be a um, they were supposed to be a stealth attacker, which was already a role fulfilled by the Eldar. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, the Eldar doubled down on this further and further as the expansions went on, getting things like all the tasty cloaking they have, yeah, and all the teleporting of buildings between wraithways or webway gates through the wraith through the through the webway with their wraithbone constructs. Yeah, but the problem is. <sighs> I don't think an RTS is all that conducive to a hit and run strategy, which is what the, which is what they seem to be designed for. Yeah, which is why they were changed for Soulstorm. Mm -hmm. And speaking of that, it's time it's time we get into Soulstorm. Oh, Soulstorm, I love you so much. This is also the place where I say witch hunters likely influenced development because the Sisters of Battle are added as a playable faction for Soulstorm. Although you want to know, you want to know what I find really weird about the opening cutscene with Soulstorm? What's that? You have, you have, you have what looks like Ig and Ta and Tao fighting each other, which okay, standard fare. And then the and then the sisters of battle just casually walk in, which doesn't make sense because yes, while the sisters of battle are, are called that because they are clad in some power armor and fighty, they are not genetically engineered like the space marines. They are in fact just really, 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 really big fangirls for Big E. And uh, decided, I'm going to fight for the Emperor, because maybe then I can give him my virginity. And yes, that, ix that is a piece of lore. They all refer to themselves as Brides of the Emperor. This man has a million strong battle harem. <laughs> which which you, you do realize what this means, right? The, em the God Emperor of Man is a, is a harem protagonist. That was already established, <laughs> Monk. Come on now. <laughs> Not only is he a harem protag, he's technically an isekai protag because it took thousands of shaman killing themselves to make one emperor. Um, I wonder if the, I wonder if this means that I can p I can piss off some of the 40k fandom by saying that the origin story of the Emperor of Man is is seen in the tales of Bastard. <laughs> You probably could. It would definitely piss off the buttermilks. Um, but you could also... You could double duty by pissing off all of the anime fans by saying, By the way, Big E, he's an isekai harem protag. <laughs> hey. Man, I, I wish Shades were here to, to hear that. I really do. Mm -hmm. I would hey, want to hear his response. Hey, we, we, get to, we get to piss off the grogs in two, in two, fan, ba in two fan bases at the same time. I see that as a win. 
That's an, that, that, that is nothing but us winning. Mm-hmm. Um, and to reference an old meme that I love so much, uh, that's us with tiger blood and Adonis DNA. <laughs> but not nearly that but much cocaine. Here, here's not the other thing that I find that really... F- the, the reason why I find this kind of weird is why the, why the hell would the Sisters of Battle give a shit about the t- about the Tau when they usually on- they usually only care about they they're usually only only on the witch hunter end of things so why would they why would they want to pick a fight with a faction that doesn't have a clue how magic works ah uh, yes uh side note the tau has no presence in the warp they saw that shit and went nope fuck that shit it is terrible we don't want to be there mm-hmm uh, they're faster than light travel is thus much slower than the rest of the galaxy, but also, you know, they don't get eaten and mind raped. Um, it's probably also think, the reason why they can hand why they can handle AI without it going berserk on them. That too, that is very likely the case. But the uh, yeah, the the other thing is the sisters of battle would not just walk in. They're, as I've already said, big fangirls. They come in with a fervor and a passion. I mean, half of their arsenal is flame weapons for a reason. They're a bunch of pyrophiliacs, for Christ's sake. You think they'd get, and yet they don't get along with the salamanders. They don't get along with anybody, monk. They hate everyone that isn't the emperor. Come on now true although they even hate the inquisition in that regard um could we compare them to k-pop stands i don't think k-pop stands if you'll excuse the pun hold a candle to the sisters of battle (laughs) no i needed to use that pun that was such a good one and you set me up for it (laughs) it's almost like i plan these things sometimes or like i just know you too well a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B, a little bit of column Z. However, the thing that the thing that really the other thing that weirds me out is the Sisters of Battle are on the cover of the box. Yet Soulstorm is an ability that's that's utilized by the other big faction that was introduced, the Dark Eldar. The uh, the biggest uh, hardcore spiked BDSM faction, yes. Uh, the what the people who would consider themselves the true uh, the true Eldar. Because we're still hedonistic fuckwads. Yes. Do you want to birth yet another bad god? Go ahead. <laughs> yes, with um, I believe the term was unrestrained, unadulterated murder fucking. <laughs> oh yeah. Dun, 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 dun. Yes. Uh, um, now it it is worth noting that, um, because of the popularity of du- because of the popularity of of um Dark Crusade, it was it um THQ, a company not exactly known for making good decisions, wanted another expansion, but Relic was already was already de- already in early development of Dawn of War two. So Iron Lore was ha- was handed the reins instead, and they basically took everything that made Dark Crusade fantastic and dialed it up to eleven. Yeah, it should be noted that Iron Iron Lore is not is not what I would cons- they're currently defunct, but I wouldn't consider them a scrub. Their yeah. ma- their their big claim to fame is ti- is um Titan Quest, which is. A pretty a pretty solid ARPG. It's even more solid nowadays with some of the updates they got when it came back. Yeah. But they took that campaign map we loved so much. Now it's four fucking planets and a few and a few moons. And if, um, I'm, be- if I'm being honest, the storyline justification for some for um so- for some of the factions isn't as strong as what came before. Isn't as strong, but. Monk, let's be honest. You don't really need much justification to just have people show up and fuck around. Mm-hmm. 
I, I, I don't care how weak the justification for the Tau being there is. Um, this, they're there, and they're better than they were in Dark Crusade by a wide margin. Um, additionally, a lot of uh, different, a lot of different uh, later introduced uh, factions started getting their own resource. And if I'm being if I'm being honest, I've the the idea the idea of an addition of an additional resource in that manner I thought was a little bit undercooked. And with and with the with the Sisters of Battle in the Dark Eldar, especially the Dark Eldar, it felt like a glorified gimmick. It was a glorified gimmick for both of them. Mm -hmm. The acts of faith and the and the. Uh, let's be honest; it was just map magic for both of them. Mm-hmm. Um, and you could you could actually pretty safely ignore it. You didn't really need to use it if you didn't want to. Um, I mean, summoning a living saint was definitely just that much more fuck you to the enemy faction. Uh, but you didn't need a living saint to you know curb stomp the enemy faction anyway. Um, it was just you know there for the shits and giggles in my opinion. But the the specialized map spaces are still there. The honor guard is still there. Planetary requisition is still there. All the fun goodies. Big maps, small maps, maps in between. Uh, and of course, the fun never stops uh, when, you're, when you're playing orcs mm -hmm. uh, or Necron. God, Necron got such a boost in this game. But the the other big the other big gimmick that I, I that is suspected to be a um a call a call from Games Workshop was the airborne units. And oh. if I'm if I'm being honest, the because the big the big reason for that is that at the time with the with the war game, um Games Workshop had a big boner for introducing airborne units into. What what was largely a boots on the ground kind of game, I never yeah. understood why I never understood why they suddenly got the got the boner for them because they have a whole separate game they they ha because I honestly think that airborne units would have been much better served in their own separate game. Yeah, um, I could definitely see that. And the airborne units in so the airborne units in Soulstorm. To be honest, they just came, they just came off as glorified hover tanks, a lot of the time. Yeah, because it it wasn't like there was a range factor that was really at play. Mm -hmm. Um, guys on the ground could shoot up at guys in the sky real easy. It wasn't a big issue, um, especially if you had an anti vehicle weapon in the squad. Oh, I've got I've got a guy right here with a rocket launcher. Bye. Um, Meltas, anything else like that? The uh, even with some of these little stumbles, I guess we could call them. Um, the fact that all of the factions were fun to play and relatively well balanced, all of whom felt fleshed out, even the new factions. Uh, really made Soulstorm just shine. Um. <laughs> I'd say I'd say there was one. There was one. Th now one would think if if there's that high of an opinion from us on Soulstorm, why is it why is it that Soulstorm gets ro gets roasted alive by by a lot by a lot of fans? I'd say there I'd say there's a couple things. One, the 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 way the the way the map is set up, trying to go across trying to go across several planets like that, didn't quite work out. And in some and in some cases resulted in some headquarters that, um, made that whose placement made no sense. Yeah, the the smartest thing to do in the campaign mode was to rush the spaceport uh, the spaceport level, which wasn't as bullshit as it was in Dark Crusade. You didn't have to collect a whole bunch of fucking servitors, mm -hmm. um, because once you got that specific, uh, spaceport. I think it was technically a webway gates here. Um, it allowed you to teleport to any webway gate, which means you could attack any planet um, yeah. pretty easily, which was 
fucking ideal. If I'm be if I'm being honest, they should have either reduced the amount of planets or just gone to one planet. Um, I think they should have made they they, they should have made uh interconnectivity between planets a little more universal. Maybe get rid uh or maybe upgrade the 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 spaceport to an actual spaceport mm-hmm. uh level and make it so just like the spaceport worked in Dark Crusade, you can land on any space that isn't an HQ. That would have probably been a better way to do it. Yeah. The other thing that didn't help is that Soulstorm initially was very much a rush job. Like it, it and it and it definitely showed it it could get pretty buggy. Uh, yes. I remember watching the AI lose its tracking around a hill three or four hundred times. The final thing that I think did not help is some of the bizarre voice direction. We've already done the Rhinos joke. We're not going to do that again. So instead, we have to bring up Commander Boreal. You Ren! Who was also voiced by Scott McNeil, and yet this is one of those cases where I blame the direction. I don't, I don't know what accent they were trying to get him to make. It fluctuates every other word. I swear to God. Mm-hmm. And thus we get some um, spes marines. Spes marines. It's 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 specifically spes marines. S-P-E-S-S-M-U-H-R-E-E-N-S. And sometimes it's all one word. Mm-hmm. And within the within that, of course, of course you had, of course you had, um, you had, you had, you had, like we said, the whole metal boxes thing. You had some people who were hamming it up, and some people who were, um, were not. And a lot of them became meme legend. The the other one that always comes to mind is Vance motherfucking Stubbs. <laughs> he sounds so normal. Vance Stubbs sounds so normal. Like, just matter of fact, you would expect this in a less hammy game. Mm-hmm. But yes, Vance motherfucking Stubbs was actually a really good character. Oh. Uh. Especially regarding his, especially re- regarding his speech, even though there's one, even though there's one little problem of, when the fuck has the has the um, has the Imperium ever had one hundred Bane blades in one place ever? How do you and how lose the fuck one? do you lose one hundred <laughs> Bane blades? How the fuck do you lose a hundred Bane blades? Man, we would have won that con- that conflict to the Karava system if only we'd had our Bane Blades. How did you lose a hundred Bane Blades? They're the size of fucking buildings! <laughs> not to mention if not to mention if you lost even one of them, you would probably get a few a um probably a one hundred page angry rant from from the near from the nearest Oh, rep- from the nearest representative of the Mechanicus. No, the Mechanicus would just send their own assassins and kill you. You lost that piece of marvelous technology? You just have to die for being an incompetent meatbag. Pro- probably kill him and then make him into a servitor. Uh, no. Probably just a skull probe. Oh, that's even worse. That was my point. <laughs> um... <laughs> but yes, the game is meme worthy, not just due to the hamminess, but due to some of the fucking stupidest shit. Um, only disappointing thing to me is that uh, Farseer Carries, the Farseer for the Eldar faction in this game, um, just not really that, not really that much of a presence. Like Maha had a presence. She was hilarious. There's a reason she's the eternal meme amongst the the three of of Winter Assault, Dark Crusade, and Soulstorm. Mm-hmm. But uh, Carius is just eh. She's meh. And of course, wasn't Gorguts the orc war chief in 
every part of Dawn of War. That guy gets around. Gorguts is the... Et- so, if Maha is the eternal meme in in, in terms of Dawn of War 1, uh, Gorguts is the eternal meme in terms of goddamn all of 40k. Uh, Warchief Gorguts is a... Uh, he's a really proper orc! <laughs> Now that be, that being said, several of the, I'd say the I'd say the um the new units, I'd say they fared better in their debuts than, um some of the previous debut factions, in yes. their, in their particular expansions, absolutely. Um, I do. It's just that the acts of, the thing that, oddly enough, the thing that ends up restricting them, is their is their gimmick of acts of faith and um souls. Well. Like, like I said, it wasn't super necessary. You could safely ignore those in almost all cases. Mm-hmm. Like I have gone through an ent- I have gone through the entire campaign on the hardest difficulty as Dark Eldar. Not pleasant. Don't do it. Um, I mean, not ju- not pleasant because n- not pleasant because you're playing Dark Eldar, not because it isn't fun to play. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And never once used any of their soul powers. Yeah, um, I'd say that I'd say the Tau fared significantly better here because the path system gave gave them some better options instead of just being a one trick pony. The path system, which yes, you had to exclude some tech tree parts to get to other tech tree parts, could either be your typical four pool rush. You could Zerg rush with these fuckers. Mm-hmm. It was so satisfying. Also, they got one of the few air units that didn't suck. That too. Th- that being the Barracuda. Yes. A u- a unit that I'm pretty sure Marvel Comics is that a certain artist at Marvel Comics is very familiar with, given that time that there was a plagiarism accusation. <laughs> But uh, the Tau, you know, they, they they could either do your your rush build, mm-hmm. or they could do your uh, dig in build. And I'll be honest, I'm usually path of the patient hunter because um, you get some of the really cool mech units there, some of the really cool crisis suits. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I just want to have all these guys with rail guns on their shoulders. It's funny we bring up railguns because that's one of the big things that's being bitched about is a railgun unit in the in the war game currently that's a little bit OP. I mean, let's be honest, Monk. Why hasn't most of the galaxy moved to railguns? In in Warhammer 40k, railguns would tear apart most things in that galaxy. I guess some people would argue that that um the that the that the Tyranids would adapt to it, but if yes, we... if if you can make a railgun using the type of technology in the thirty first century, because that's when technology was still being widely used, and that's why I'm going to do do it. Tyranids, how are Tyranids going to adapt to a tungsten projectile coated in iron so that it's magnetic, uh, being accelerated to 2% the speed of light? Tyranids are fast, but they're not that, but they're not sub-light speed fast. Not only that, but, um, I'm pretty sure a hive leviathan would be like, oh, what's that sparkle? And then die. Just put a goddamn... Railgun on the front of the battle barge. That's terrifying, and I love it. And um, and now you've just given the reasonable Marines ideas. Fuck it! I'm building my own 40k with blackjack and hookers. <laughs> um, if I know we've done fair, a fair few world building episodes on the Geek Watch, but that one I don't think we'd be able to pull off because of no. all the moving parts. No. No, monk. No. Um, besides, we'd all we'd end up creating is just bright hammer. Uh, I can't say you're wrong. I also, 
I also can't say that, uh, <laughs> that <laughs> I just want to see giant battleship sized rail guns. Yes, That's I know. So I know you want you want to we you want to weaponize somebody you want to weaponize a planet's asteroid belt. I get it. To no, that's mass. That's a mass driver, monk. Yeah, because you'd lit you would literally bomb a you would literally bomb a planet into the Stone Age with, ironically, real stones. Yes, yes. You you understand? You understand that sometimes cavemen just go throw big rock. <laughs> however, however. This is, this is where um this is where the sa the saga of the ori of the original Dawn of Wars ends and the one one thing we still have to cover. Oh yes, before the we before we get to that, we have to cover the mods because there there's been a saying for the longest time. You get Dark Crusade for the campaign, and you also you also get the previous one, so you can actually play as all the factions because of the because of that whole it's standalone but not bullshit. Yeah, and you get Soulstorm for the mods. There are two mods in particular that st that stand out. The first is the Apocalypse mod. Yes, which excellent. Basically, is do basically is doing, <sighs> um, 40k with Apocalypse rules, which I think this is as good a time as any to explain what Apocalypse rules are. No, oh, friends. In 40k, first we have to explain that there are rules about how many units you can have based on points, or at least that's the most common way to do it. Mm -hmm. I that's think there's that war whole. Game... That's how most war games um, do it. Even though, even though something like Anima Tactics had level, for all intents and purposes, it's points. Yeah, I mean nowadays, uh, shit, shitty 40k, shitty 40k of seventh, eighth, and ninth edition has battle level as well but again beside the point most games depending on how small or large you want them to be are between 500 and 2000 points these can be a small game of a few squads skirmishing to a decent sized force depending on how you're kitted out and pointed out of you know an armor platoon with a few infantry units with it along those lines Apocalypse rules are, fuck it, there's no point limit, or most of the time it was like 50,000 points, mm -hmm. so that you can do things like field titans. And I'm not, I'm not joking there, there were literal two and a half foot tall models of Imperator titans. They are, they are bit... Imperator Titan models are big enough that they, that they rival the size of some of the shorter people in our temple. They're the size of small children. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Two and a half to three feet tall. The size of small children. And in universe, <clears throat> an Imperator Titan is the, si is the size of a mountain. Yeah. Hundreds of meters tall. Hundreds of meters tall. Um... Which is why they're two and a half feet tall compared to your units, which are like an inch to two inches tall, depending. It's also no. that's also the reason why um, I'm not has has Commissar Gamza ever asked how Godzilla would fare in the 40k universe? I think I get, he has. So I get the feeling a a fight between Imperator Titan and Godzilla would be one would think it would be interesting, but it would be extremely one sided. The Imperator would win. I'm I'm not I I love Godzilla to death, but Godzilla is flesh and blood, and if that Imperator Titan has any of the normal long range weaponry that an Imperator Titan has, that flesh and blood is going bye bye. At range, at ranges of where you don't see Godzilla, only the Titan does. Mm -hmm. So yes, extremely one sided. It's it's a it's a sad day to admit it, but sometimes Kaiju just cannot win. Um, yes. now, except if they're Tyranid Bio-Titans, mm -hmm. which brings us to the Unification mod. Well, I want, I want to touch on the Apocalypse mod a, a bit. The, uh, it, 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 is very, it is certainly ambitious with what it wants to do, and it does a lot of um, very good upgrades to a, lot, to a lot of factions. However, running the mod is Russian Roulette. 
sometimes it'll crash, sometimes it won't, depending on how good your computer is and how it feels that day. Um, Even if your computer is pretty good, it's still Russian roulette. That's why I said how it feels that day. <laughs> uh, my favorite <laughs> thing... Oh, go ahead. You can hear the game engine screaming in pain. Because not only did the Apocalypse mod make it so that you could field massive amounts of units and introduced Apocalypse-sized maps to account for that, it also added new units. The aforementioned Titans are one, but let me regale you with one of my favorite lesser-known uh, Necron weapons, the Ionic Orb. Oh god, I know where this is going. The Ionic Orb... What I like to call the sun gun, not stun gun, sun gun, is a weapon where a transcendent Catan broke down a star, used the materials to create an artificial star inside a controllable field, so that when it's charged up enough, they open a little shutter in the sphere and just shoot a sun at you. I mean... Effectively, it's just a solar flare. You'll be fine. You only need SPF a billion. Uh, but yes, they open up this sphere to shoot a sun ray at you. Or if they don't feel like opening up the sphere, they just kind of vent it in a halo around the thing. And in the Apocalypse mod, you could... Every faction had some sort of doomsday level uh, at the end of their tech, tech tree, like the Ionic Orb or a Titan. They had a long charge time. You could only use them like once every five minutes, and five minutes in an RTS is an eternity. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you had to get to the end of your tech tree to get them in the first place. But the Apocalypse mod was made to be used in unison with another mod. I've heard that's where we get to the unification mod, which is not is not a is te, is tech is one of those cases of taking a taking a bunch of different mods and com and combining them all together and adding a shitload of content. Shitload of content, shitload of code optimization so that you could get stabilization in some cases. Uh, one of the things that the unification mod added that warmed my cold dead meteorite tungsten heart um <clears throat> is the tyranids mm -hmm. you could actually which is always fun bio titans are not nearly as large as actual titans don't let it they're like about the size of a warhound which i'd say is about the size of a gundam uh, i would say more the size of a Marauder from Battletech. Somewhere around there. Yeah. A, 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 assault, a assault class battle mech. Yeah. Oh. But I... Let me get... As far as... When it comes... But it can't be... It can't be that many... It can't be that many um, new new factions. It's... It, Jesus Christ. Let's go... Let's go through... Let's go through the fucking <laughs> list. <laughs> Fuck off, Monk. Fuck off! No, we okay. got... They have to. They have... They have to. They have to. They have to know. Yeah. So, we have the Adeptus Mechanicus, specifically the exploratory um, side of it, side of things, which means we have Skitari, the Steel Legion, the Witch Hunters, hmm. the and that, that's for the Imperium of Man. For the Astartes, we have the Space Wolves, Black Templars, still have Blood Angels, Dark Angels, Demon Hunters, Imperial Fists. The Legion of the Damned, <laughs> which the sa the sa the um, salamander and and the salamanders. Then we have um, we of course still have Chaos Marines, but we also have but that's that can be basically um, the Black Legion. We also have Chaos Demons and some sub t and some s and which leads to some interesting setups on that front. The Emperor's Children, the World Eaters. The Thousand Sons, um, Eldar Harlequins, and the Tyranids. And all of these, 
added all of that. The factions that were in Vanilla Soulstorm all get updates. Some of them getting whole new units, complete with whole new voice acting. And whole new arsenals, and whole new war gear to add to those units, and... Even the they... vanilla units get um, get a resolution touch-up. Yeah. Unification mod is... be-all, end-all of how to play Soulstorm. You run unification, and if you're feeling really masochistic apocalypse... Mm-hmm. And you just go into a giant map and hope your computer doesn't cry itself to sleep. And by cry itself to sleep, I mean the eternal sleep of the dead. Yeah. And so, and even within all of these, a lot... Now, the quality of, so, of a lot of the... A lot of the new factions does vary, as one might expect. And with some of them, you have to get used to whole new playstyles. The Explorators, I think, are a good are a good example, simply because the simply because the buildings that they can build is far more limited, but they expand in other manners. Mm -hmm. It's um, kind of like getting used to how the Necrons didn't do anything with a uh, with requisition. Yeah, because they only have two buildings at tier one and one building at tier two. Mm -hmm. But they get but they get a. F but they get plenty more uh, when it comes to when it comes to units, and the and of course there's the whole thing with autonomous at automa at automaton units and data and data link units, which allow allow for some interesting results. And also for me personally, I've always I've always loved the look of Skitari. Access allowed. And as merry suish as Grey Knights can be, I I appreciate them. I appreciate them getting more love in in um essentially essentially the essentially the essentially their own um not their own faction per se, but not be but not being saddled with the Sisters of Battle, which was always kind of questionable to me. Questionable and also unfortunate. I think it. I think it's largely because of the fact that it's kind of hard to do a full-on Grey Knights army. I mean, unless you're playing the war game, that's true. Because the Grey Knights, much like all the uh, Chambra milit uh, Militant, um, are a subset of specialized Space Marine types for the. Uh, for the particular ordo they're attached to. Mm -hmm. And of course, the Grey Knights are attached to Ordo Malleus, the anti-demon unit, and also one of the most fanatical units. Mm -hmm. uh, ordo Malleus doesn't fuck around. Um, but just remember, Ordo Malleus has the glorious legend of the Sun Eater and the goddamn Space Hell. <laughs> Oh, I'd also be remiss if I didn't point out how the Emperor's children are glass cannons. Well, I mean, they like pain. Mm -hmm. Kind of makes sense. They're, they're Slaneshi, for anyone who didn't understand. And also, for those of you who don't understand that what Slaneshi means, don't look it up. If you look it up, we take no responsibility for what happens. But they do start out with noise marines, which are a living meme into themselves. Ah, yes, the marines that rock you to death. Or, um, as some people have put it, weaponized dubstep. Didn't, didn't Saints Row 4 steal that idea? <laughs> <laughs> but I, uh, in seriousness, I, I, I like to think that maybe present Mike was inspired by the noise marine. <laughs> And they do they do get the fallen sisterhood as as well if you want to go that route because the whole I'd say for, I'd say for a lot of the new factions the whole that whole that whole path system that was introduced with the Tau I think a lot of designers on the in the mod community looked at that and saw an opportunity. Yeah, giving giving you choices where you have to choose one type of play style over another instead of just relying on the tried and true play style of whatever faction you're playing. Mm -hmm. Um. He's genius. More player choice is good. 
Of course, what that effectively also did is kind of take away from the Tau's uniqueness. But that's a trade I'm willing to take. Fuck their greater good. That and it's not like it's not like the Tau didn't get love from the from the mod anyways. True. <laughs> god, did they Oh my god. But I don't, so, don't want to think about it. But that's where we get to the great schism. Um when when Dawn of War 2 came around and f the first mistake that was made was was it being on um Games for Windows multiplayer being on Games for Windows Live and that also functioning as the DRM for the thing. Much like, much like with um, Shadowrun 2007, and yeah. the problem is when that went up. Much like when GameSpy went up, um, multi the game was rendered unplayable until it was transferred over to Steam a few years ago. Yep. So you can you can add that to another to the list of THQ's bad decisions. THQ has a lot of those. They especially had a lot of those at that point. It's no surprise that they went bankrupt, and I know some people would say that um, that they're that they're back in the form of THQ Nordic, not in not entirely. I mean, what was essentially bought there to create THQ Nordic was the IPs, mm -hmm. the IPs and the iconography. Um, yeah. THQ as they were doesn't exist. Um, and I think I think the world is better for, is better for it simply because there were a lot. In the in the late two thousand in the late two thousands, THQ was throwing was throwing money at anything and everything. Essentially, yeah. they made the same mistake that Midway did. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and if you a lot, you know, it's it's I don't want to I don't want to bring up sports too much in this, but it's always funny when people say that you can just um spend a that you can just spend a shitload of money and wit and buy yourself a championship. No, you can't. Which is the which is the sole which is one of the big reasons why I loved sharing the um, right the video on the Maple Leafs failures to you because that's exactly what they've d been doing for fifty years and how's that worked out? Mm, zilch for fifty years. <laughs> no, um, I'll be honest. Stepping into Dawn of War two, I haven't played the game. Um. And I'm I'm probably part of the schism that Monk is referencing. Yeah, because <sighs> if if by some miracle I ever got to interview somebody uh, who worked at Relic, this is where I, this is one of those things I'd be I'd be asking questions about. Now going going from going going into a direct sequel in this regard, changes are understandable, and I have to I have to put it with plenty of bullshit about changes just be just being a fan of tabletop RPGs. Yep. For, for some changes for better, some changes for worse, but changes nonetheless. And um, and I'm pretty sure esports players have to put up with it just as much regarding all the micro changes to try to try and to try and fix a given game or to try and work themselves out of mistakes. Hi, hi, Riot. Hi, Overwatch. Fuck you, well, fuck both of you. I. And the thing, the removal of the removal of base building and the em and the emphasis on the emphasis on cover and the emphasis on a more skirmish style was definitely going to ruffle some feathers. But the the question that I ha the question that I was go that I always wanted to ask is. Was it really necessary to remove remove base building mechanics in order to do it? Within the na within the narrative, I could somewhat I could somewhat see it because of the style of narrative that the game is going for. Because the... go ahead, Dawn Dawn of War one, Dawn of War One had a narrative that is that is that was very much a that was. Very much focused around Gabriel Angelos. Mm -hmm. Dawn of War Two is more of a ensemble tale with the with with uh, with the com with the different commanders that you ha that you have in the company. And I... I'm not entire. I'm not entirely sure. Um, there are benefits and drawbacks. Sorry to sorry to cut you off twice in a row. Well, it's it's not a problem. I I can't actually speak on that particular point since, as I said, I haven't played the game. Mm -hmm. 
the the primary issue I had with Dawn of War 2 changing as drastically as it did is um it's it's a squad tactics game for the most part uh you're managing a squad in real time and while that could be fun as its own thing within uh within warhammer 40k that could be real fun the name of dawn of war and saying it's an rts i'm looking for a very specific style of, of play um base building included as part of that but a war to me does not imply controlling one squadron in the war a war to me implies total battlefield control calling something dawn of war to me means large scale battle if i wanted a squad management game um i'd want it to be a little more personal maybe instead of directly managing the whole squad you're you play as the commander and you send uh you know general orders to the rest of the squad set them up behind cover and stuff and make your own kill zones and everything or if i wanted a squad tactics game that was really in depth xcom style i do what mechanicus did mechanicus the big the the big old game of chicken i mean I'm not talking specifically about the timer that you have on the waking Necron ship, but uh, more specifically the fact that it's, in in all but name, it's XCOM Mechanicus style. Uh, you've, you've, got the, the, you've got things like Overwatch, you've got personalized skills between soldiers, you've got the, the emphasis on cover and tactics. That would still be fun with Space Marines. I'd love to do that with Space Marines on a smaller, more insulated, contained story. And there are plenty of stories in the books and in the lore of a single Space Marine unit doing the impossible. Because there, there is a reason that the ludonarrative dissonance of, of, of the war game is what we call movie Marines. <clears throat> where Space Marines in lore are essentially your action hero badasses just doing grim, dark murder bullshit um, and doing it as efficiently as possible. And they lose men. It happens all the time. Mm -hmm. Now, I would love to have played that. If I'm, be if I'm, being, uh, if I'm being honest, um, I, do th I do think that... The, 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 weird thing, the weird thing is... The campaign and the multiplayer feel like to have always come across like two completely different games. The campaign I love they br they brought in the meta map in in a way that in a way that certainly makes sense and you have to and you have to make some tough you have to make some tough choices regarding what missions you're going to deploy on because of the tier because of the levels of tyranid infestation you have to deal with. Mm -hmm. And it it um. They do handle the Tyranids well in in presenting them with this sense of dread. Um, I can't. I. I'm I'm kind of remind I'm I'm kind of reminded in a roundabout way of the of the of the time limit issue that you have to that you have to somewhat deal with with the whole th with the whole three day the whole how you manage the fi the final days of um ter of Termina in. Majora's Mask. Yeah. Just on, just on a dip, just, it's not exactly the same, but it's not far off. Yeah. The other, the other ish, the, uh, but the downside of that and how well they do the Tyranids is that once they, sh a rid it starts out in the usual setup. Orcs are, orcs are having a, orcs are having a, a big green fuck around, um, that lead, that leads into worse things. But once that happens, the presence of the orcs and the Eldar feel like a afterthought in the campaign. Let's However, be fair. Let's be fair. In the lore, anything feels like afterthought when Nids will show up. However, once the sh 
However, when it comes to when it comes to the um, squad commanders, treating them treating them as as characters in an R as characters in an RPG complete with, complete with loot and uh, and upgrade trees. It ac it actually ends up working be better in practice than I thought than I thought it would, and can allow for some very interesting builds, even though um, even though at higher levels some certain characters, especially Cyrus and Avatis, can be big fucking wheels of cheese, especially Avatis with the fact that you can that you can potentially give him unlimited grenades. Grenade out. <laughs> or or ha or. One of the other infamous builds that got that got cheesy was Cyrus's infinite cloak. I am the knight. <laughs> doesn't exactly help. Doesn't exactly help or hurt the. F it arguably helps or hurts the fact that um, the the meme the meme lord title has been passed from Scott McNeil to Steve Bloom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Who reminds you? Caraval was a mistake, and is is also is always the first guy to ki to kill your good vibe anytime you kick ass in a mission, which makes sense given the fact that he's the one guy in the group who has knowledge about the Tyr Tyranids, if only because he's seen them during his time on the Death Watch. Which, as an aside, why have we never gotten a Death Watch video game? We had. If you're about to say Eternal Crusade, I will punch you. No, I legitimately thought we had. No, we ha we have not. We have not. Huh? I've che I've checked around. There's certainly been games. There's certainly been games that have ha that have had multiple um, Space Marine factions, but we've never had one focused on the Death Watch. And given the f given the fact that the Death Watch is supposed to be this special unit, de um. That is com that is composed of Space Marines, seconded from different from different chapters, mm -hmm. which is which is why it was used to do the to do the Space Marine quotient for the um, role playing game. Mm -hmm. You think it would you think that would be tailor built for a get for a game that for a game that's in this particular style? In fact, if I if I were reconstructing Dawn of War two, I would have it be a Death Watch game. With an ensemble cast of, of people from different chapters, I'd be more willing to play that game. You know, a force commander from the Blood Mer from the Blood Ravens, a sc a scout from the Dark Angels, a um a for a um a vet a assault a assault marine a assault marine from s from say the Space Wolves, you know that kind of thing. Not a fuck with people. Make it a wolf priest from the Space Wolves. <laughs> um, and po and the thing, but the thing of it is, the the um the multi the multiplayer has 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 um a lot has a has war gear upgrades that would have been on a tech tree, and this is where I this is where I think a lot of people may. This, along with the map reuse, is I think where a lot of people make the MOBA comparison, especially mm -hmm. since it's especially since it, the way to win is either getting control points or destroying the enemy base, which technically happened in the technically happened in the past. But the reason you got control points wasn't to assure victory; it was the fact that the more control points you had, the more resources you were going to be able to generate over a period of time. Requisition was generated by control points in Dawn of War One. Mm -hmm. Your there were certain buildings like your H, your actual HQ building that generated a small amount of it, but if you were really going to generate requisition, you had to capture control points and build listening posts or whatever the equivalent does was uh, of them was for other factions mm -hmm. to, uh, on the point to enhance how much requisition you could get. Just like you yeah. built power generators to get power and. Games like Command and Conquer and StarCraft have certainly had um, missions where you, where you had a more where you had a more limited kit, but they were always one but they were always one offs. the The campaign in Dawn of War Two felt like it was taking those one offs and building a whole game around it, which I'm not opposed to, but it lean but it leans a little bit less into the idea of an RTS 
and more into a role playing game. And yeah, can you can you combine an RTS and a role playing game? Yes, but I think but I think the name Dawn of War carries certain expectations. Yes, and again, I guess that's the biggest reason for my part of the schism. Dawn of War implies to me large scale battles, mm -hmm. like not even not even that I'm expecting from the previous game. Just the fact that someone says this is the Dawn of War implies to me huge armies fighting each other. And then I'm given a game that's squad tactics RPG-ish. I just lost interest. Yeah. I gave I gave it its chance and it cer it certainly has it certainly ha has enough to to say that it's not without it's not without merit. It's it's just that I think I think um, Re I think Relic was I think Relic didn't see the bigger picture, and mm -hmm. it's n it's not like it's not like there was a skirmish board game that w that Games Workshop was hawking for a, rid a ridiculous price at the time to justify this shift, which is why I'm putting it more on Relic. Um, of course, there's also the possibility that they wanted to do just 40k uh, meets Company of Heroes two. Which I like Company of Heroes too, but I didn't like it at first, largely because of certain oversights, namely mortars. Because mm. somebody That's had enough. the bright idea to have mortars not scatter. Which doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense, and multiplayer matches redu were reduced to who can build the most amount of mortars in the least amount of time. Even tr even trying to mess even trying to mess around with pop with pop cap in order to get even more mortars. Which how does that work? It re it worked, but the matches weren't all that interesting. It's largely largely because of the fact that when when you have when you have a wide variety of choices and there's one choice that rules over all. You have you have a game that's not going to be as interesting. When one choice clearly outshines all others, you don't actually have a choice. Mm -hmm. You can and you that is and that incidentally that is a good summation of wh of why we hate the um, casting boner that we've seen in certain fantasy games. Mm -hmm. Quadratic wizards, linear melee can sh just fucking die mm -hmm. now that being said there were t there were two expansions wor worth no worth noting regarding dawn of war there was one mini expansion that just added the last stand um game mode which can mm. be su which can be summarized as a as a um as a wa as a wave based survival mode because remember late 2000s and everybody was doing that yeah everybody was learning from gears of war Mm -hmm. I'd say Gears of War and Gears of War and Left 4 Dead, and The Last Stand is nothing more than their take on it. I'm not going to cover yeah. too much on it because there's not a whole lot to say. It's essentially it's taking the multiplayer rules and just and just putting it, just doing a wave defense mode. Yep. Yeah. Which can certain can certainly work. Oh, although I'd I'd argue I'd argue there's probably be, there's probably better wave defense modes in the Warcraft 3 mod scene. That being that being said, the there was one add-on expansion, which was kind of a direct sequel in the form of Chaos Rising. Mm -hmm. Which Chaos Ri Chaos Rising, I find I I liked and disliked at the same time. What I liked about it is the is that the story shifts into a whodunit mystery, a, uh, because one of the commanders is a traitor. And and has and has go and for one reason or another has has gone to the, has gone to the side of chaos. In, adi in addition to the fact that Elif Elifax comes Elifax has come back. There's also you can't, an, you can't keep a good chaos marine down, frankly because you can't die. There's also an appearance by Abaddon later on, but who gives a shit? <laughs> 
Tribadon? But the failure? The I but the one of the big ideas that they were building around is the is the idea that there are certain that there's certain chaos equipment that's going to raise that's going to raise a corruption level, which can result in multiple endings as well as as well as some choices that can result in multiple people being the traitor. And each of the each of them has different ish reasons for being the traitor. Um, the tech marine is the one who is the one who's the canon one, but there was some. But the most interesting betrayal incident is um, Cyrus. <laughs> his whole his whole reasoning for betrayal is being sick of the blood of the blood ravens' incompetence. That's so good. Especially since he especially since a. The the way that the way that the smaller scale has is justified in universe is that the Kaurava campaign was a disaster and they lost a shitload of their of their troops. Mm -hmm. So they so they end up retreating to their recruiting worlds to try and rebuild their numbers. Which bit of a stretch, but I can sort of see it. Now, the big pro the big problem that I have the big problem that I have with it is that, much like with the Valkyrie profile game on the DS, which we'll get we'll get to that one of these days. Mm -hmm. the The idea is sound. Give people yeah. give people the temptation of power, but at a cost. The problem is if you try and go a full purity route, several missions were are vastly stacked against you, even on the easiest difficulty. And it don't, and in, in some of the worst case scenarios, it feels like you have to take some corruption in order to progress. And with, the, with some of the other games that have... Um, Covenant of the Plume was notorious for this as well. I'd say the... I'd s and to a certain extent, Mega Man Battle Network 3 was, but not as terribly. Yeah. You could go you could go through the entirety of either of the Battle Network 3 games without using a single dark chip. Made things a little more challenging, but you could do it. Yeah, there, but there's a difference between challenging and bullshit. Mm -hmm. A lot of the missions in Chaos Rising got bullshit levels if you were if you um were not if, if not using not... Ca corrupting influences. Mm -hmm. And, but even even with that, the the big takeaway from Chaos Rising was the was twofold. One, um, a, a new planet that's that is that is a winter tundra, so you know that's going to be up my alley. Mm -hmm. And two, again, a who done it mystery. Well, whodunits work best in snowy places, Monk. That's why. Mm -hmm. Which I do have to wonder if the I do have to wonder if the if um because of the combination of a snowy tundra and a who and a one of us is a traitor kind of thing was somebody at Relic watching the thing or a murder on the Orient Express. I can go either way, honestly. Now, the, but that being said, after that was a full standalone expansion in the form of Retribution, which could be considered the could be considered the best and the clo the closest thing to get to being anything like what we what we had with um with the with um Dark Crusade, even though there aren't as many factions. The only mm -hmm. factions you have are the Blood Ravens, the Orcs, led by a Freebooter, um, the Eldar, the Tyr the Tyranids, the Space the Chaos Space Marines, and the Imperial Guard. Even though the Imperial Guard representative is an Inquisitor. And the. Th the thing that certainly the thing that certainly helped 
with with um, retribution was the was the return was the return of honor guard as well as faction abilities mm -hmm. as well as the fact that you had that you had multiple campaigns to go to go through you didn't have the you didn't have the RP the RPG and loot stuff that you that you did bef that you did previously, but it's a little bit of a mi a little bit of a middle ground. I'd say I'd say retri I'd say Retribution could be oddly enough considered a Dawn of War three more than the well Dawn of War three that we got. Mm. And. We it also it also gave us some closure to to certain stories. We got to we got to see um, Kyra, Kairos after he after he had turned traitor. And and his he, infamous. They should have speech. known. They should have known he was a traitor. They should have known he was a traitor. Why? Because he's a psyker. Because his name is Kairos. Yeah, that's a, let's well. Let's not forget this is the same setting that thought the name Conrad Kurz was a good idea. Yes, but no, Kairos is literally the name of the of the greater demon of of Zinch. Mm -hmm. Which is uh, which is where which is even funnier because in his infamous speech he says, "Blood for the blood god, skulls for the skull throne." He's a psyker. Orn doesn't care so long as he bludgeons people to death with his psychic powers. Yeah, it's there's there's been some debate about whether or not he considers whether or not he considers psychers as something different from sorcerers. But e but even even with that, I w I will admit that the that. Having having the commander for the orc faction be a freebooter ends up ends up with some hilarious stuff, namely him wanting namely him wanting to kick the inquisitor's ass. Why? He likes her hat. That doesn't surprise me. <laughs> and then then after all of this, after THQ went belly up, um. Sega ended up buying the ended up buying the rights, and so and some people and some people were thinking, hey, this this means that we're, this means that we might get um, we might get the Total War folks wor working on working on um, Warhammer and 40k stuff, which we did, and Total War Warhammer is pretty good, even if some of Creative Assembly's DLC bullshit still annoys me. Ah, Creative Assembly, when will you ever stop being bullshit? Yeah, and they've um, Total War Warhammer Two felt felt like it felt like a glorif a glorified add-on expansion rather than a sequel, and three, it actually feels like a it actually feels like a sequel, although it although from what I from what I've been seeing there's some bug issues. I keep telling I keep telling you you it Warscape is not cutting it anymore. Mm-hmm. Make a new engine. I think they're. I'd like to think that they're gonna. Ha they're gonna have to. But then again, Bethesda keeps insisting that they can use the creation engine on the on the PS5 and and Xbox Series X hardware. When it could barely. I should ha it could barely hold it, its own weight on the PS4. I should hope that Creative Assemblies is at least smart enough to look at Bethesda and be like, I never want to be like them. I should hope, but perhaps that's too much optimism for today. They did. Tr they did try. They have been trying to argue that Shogun Two: Fall of the Samurai is retroactively part of their sagas um, subseries of Total War games, which leads me to the question: Why didn't? You, why didn't you also say that with Attila? Mm-hmm. However. When, however, when it came to the when it came to the 40k treatment from from Sega, the main thing that we got was Dawn of War three, which I still have. It feels it feels like a whole different it feels like a whole different team worked on it, and 
was more working on things from mandate than anything else. Putting aside the fact that we're ba we're back down to three we're back down to three factions, we have I've seen I've seen some people com compare it to League. I do think that a better comparison is Warcraft Three, especially mm -hmm. with the especially with the way that hero that hero units and the, and um, elite units are meant to be the stars of the show, just going just going through things like it's an Omega Force game. Eh. You know, why hasn't there been a war a, a Warhammer 40k Omega Force game? When do we get Warhammer 40k Musou, you cowards? And no, Space Marine and Space Marine 2 do not count. I'd like to think it's because Omega Force and Team Ninja have enough on their plate as it is. They also know better than to get in bed with Games Workshop. <clears throat> that too. <laughs> because with with current Games Workshop, they'd make it all about Primaris Marines. Primaris Ultramarines at that. <sighs> And I know some people might say, but what? But you guys, but you guys love, um, love Captain Titus in Space Marine, and he was an Ultra Smurf. He was an Ultra Smurf, but first and foremost, he was a badass. And more, more importantly, the pr the reason why Ultra Smurfs get the hate that they do is because of try of trying to make them into something that they're not. Trying to make them into this god's gift to not o not only the Imperium but the other but the other Space Marine chapters, as if they're the ideal of w of what a Space Marine chapter should be. Because they follow the Codex of Stardust to the letter, they are perfect. You want to know what I find absolutely hilarious about that? They don't. One and they, they aren't. Don't. One they don't. Two they aren't. Three. Even the man who wrote the Codex Astartes did not want that thing to be a to-the-letter-you-must-always-do-this thing. Yes, even Girly Man, their own Primarch, the man who wrote the Codex Astartes, did not say, you must slavishly follow everything here. Mm -hmm. But once he was put in stasis, they are all like, oh, we have to slavishly follow it to the letter! Just like the God Emperor saying, don't treat me like a god, I'm just an emperor and a man. Suddenly becoming the God Emperor when he's put upon the Golden Throne. Girly Man followed the same model. And when he's woken up from stasis, one of the few things I have to give Games Workshop writers credit for in this lore is Gilliman being absolutely livid at the state of the Imperium. Mm-hmm. He was essentially TTS Emperor Light. <laughs> <laughs> that be that being said, the uh, one of the idea in some ways, like in some ways, it definitely felt like Dawn of War Three was trying to turn itself into an esport, especially with some of the ways that they marketed the game. As much as I like Simon Miller, he had no business being in that interview. True. And there is also the there is also the fact that the in the um the ne you know how we talked about how there was no there there felt like there were no real stakes when it came to the narrative. This applies just as much with dawn well with the narrative with Winter Assault. This applies just as much with the narrative in Dawn of War Three. Yes. And on. And the thing, the thing that's all the more galling is for, for all of for all of two's faults, at the very at the very least, it was properly supported. Mm -hmm. And you had you had it didn't take it you didn't take long before you had three ways to play, campaign, last stand, and multiplayer, and each was each was going to have its own identity. Yeah, there wasn't a whole lot of that in this, and the. You, and the only the only the only thing memorable for me in the on the matter is the introduction of imperial knights but let's be, but as i said beforehand i firmly believe that imperial knights were added to the lore of 40k 
because at the time they were getting their ass kicked by Privateer Press. Probably. While Privateer Press isn't flawless, they were the one of the big things with War Machine was the Steam Jacks. Mm -hmm. And how and how and how they were u and how they were utilized. So trying to, so trying to do a Imperial Knight, which was supposed to be a more a smaller and more maneuverable mecha as opposed to the giant titans. It makes it makes a bit it makes a bit of sense, even though Imperial, even though um, Imperial Knights al n always always felt ca always felt kind of forced whenever you try and put them into the lore, because the, one of the big questions that's going to be asked is why why are why are they not why are they not integrated with the Mechanicus? Yeah. Especially, especially since if you need if you need something to have a to have a knight archetype, there's several Space Marine chapters that are pretty much that. <laughs> especially the Dark Angels. Asmodai, make him repent. <laughs> but. I'd, but I'd say I'd say the I'd say the um, problem with something like Dawn of War three is the fact that the fact that they tried to please everyone and no one at the same time while for, while forgetting while forgetting what came before e even in that process. Mm -hmm. um, I do find it funny that they that they claim that they went with a bunch of new voice actors because they didn't want to. They want they wanted they wanted to reinforce the Britishness of the game. You know, it totally was not because of the fact that the vo that the voice actors guild was on strike at the time. Mm -hmm. But for whatever reason, they decided to bring they decided to bring in Ga bring Gabriel Angelos back, as if as if what happened in retro in the dawn in the Dawn of War games up until that point of him becoming chapter master didn't happen. And basically trying to revert him to the way he was acting in the first Dawn of War. Yeah. Even though he still has God Splitter. For some reason. For some reason. However, I do think... I do think that there is the possibility of a of a middle ground between between the between the squad style approaches of two and the lar and the large scale base building operations of one. I think there is a way to do a middle ground. They just chose a way that what the way that was was unfocused. And then afterwards, they complained about how they'd love to make they love they just wanted to make a great game, but all but all the, but people were so harsh on them. It's like, cry more. You made a you made a shit game, and now you're paying for it. And all That's that you did to support works. all that you did to support it was a few skin packs. <laughs> <clears throat> but I don't want to do a full reconstruction. But hypothetically speaking, what if you were if you were to try and have a middle have a middle ground between the t between the two playstyles, um, how would you approach it? Um. Hmm. I'd actually approach it like um, almost like designing a a kit for like a thousand point game on the tabletop um you, you'd have your different squads probably two or three maybe a vehicle or two mm -hmm. um that would be like your your primary squad you could have them build bases like you they, they'd actually have to have you know the units to build bases like all rts do um as sort of more reinforcement points or resupply points mm -hmm. rather than 
more making more and more and more units and you could also have a, a a building or two dedicated to if one of the units gets wiped out that you instead treat it as like oh they got medivaced out or whatever and they're recuperating here mm -hmm. um i'm not sure how you'd implement the normal resource allocation of an rts uh instead your your resource allocation would have to be um something a little more esoteric i'm not quite sure what i don't know a middle ground between quad tactics and and full-on uh, big war rts is hard for me to touch upon um because to me the two play styles don't mesh well but that's just to me yeah I do, for for me personally, um, I think I think one I think one one easy one um one fix that I'd probably approach is the char the the ensemble characters that you saw with Dawn of War two. Those are the hero units for a get for a given um a given type of marine. Okay. You know, bring bring out marines, and then at the high tier, you bring out the, you bring out heroes. Yeah. <clears throat> especially since especially since each of each of them kind of represents a different a different branch, assault, assault tactical, tech, um, librarian in some cases, and so and so on. Mm hmm. Oh, as well. Oh, scouts is the one I was is the one I kept I kept forgetting about. Um, especially since the and give and given that, I would prob you could probably you could probably keep the upgrade tree that you saw with you saw with the RPG setups, but take the route that um, Valkyria Chronicles did. Because in because in that even though Valkyria Chronicles is a, is a whole different experience and in some people could call it anime XCOM, you are when you do level ups you're not leveling up individual units but you're leveling that type of unit. Mm -hmm. and to that to that end I think I think that going that going that route where you're going through a Diablo style upgrade tree for e for each unit instead of le instead of the instead of the setup, the um, path-like setup that they went with, is mm -hmm. is certainly one approach that could be done. Possibly integrate tactics as a as a new form of of um, path. Because there are there are subtypes with the hero unit in Last Stand and in multiplayer, but not so not so much in the campaign. And that's the other thing the. The idea of a separate experience with the campaign compared to multiplayer is admirable, but I don't think I don't think it was a good idea. Mm -hmm. And more more import more importantly, I do th I do think that mul multiplayer needs a needs a tech tree instead instead of the ability war gear setup that they had because. When you're when you're doing when you're doing a match in an RTS, you need to always be building to something. Yeah. That's that's why util, that's why utilizing tactics would probably be would probably be a good approach. The um the only thing I'd really change on that matter is being able to switch tactics a bit more freely. Mm hmm. You know, so you, instead instead of the hyper focus on a on a given tactic, you are you are switching between them, so you're able to adjust your st your style on the fly. Okay. And the approach the approach with this is that instead of instead of in a lot of the unification mod factions, the your choice of path it was going to determine what high tier units you would be able to get. Instead of that determining high tier units, I would rather have it that it determines the the um, path of what equipment you are able to get for e for each faction. If that if I'm making sense with that. Mm -hmm. I I understand what you're trying to say. 
So that and that would so some somebody so one ta one tactic might be might be good old might be good old bolters and grenades. Another one might be um might be more energy weapon based. Another another might be more flame weapons. Yeah. And obvious, obviously, that's just using the Space Marines as an example because the blood throughout the games, the Blood Ravens have been a jack of all trades kind of archetype. They're not the best at one one specific thing, but they're good at a bunch of different things. A way to say, here's what here's what here's what the game has to offer. Pick something you like, and if you if you really like that, here's some other factions to try out. I do think, but in at the end of the day, I think that Dawn of War Two onward should not have had the title Dawn of War, and I usually hate that ar that argument. I mm. we talked we talked about this when we did the video on Nintendo Direct, and how I ha how I hated that argument when it came to Chrono Cross or when it came to D and D Fourth Edition. But yeah. in this case, I do think it's warranted simply because of how how it was tr how um, the campaign was clearly trying for a different experience. Mm -hmm. And I think I think at the time, Relic should have just bit the bullet and tried to make a 40k um, real time role playing game, which would have been better. And. Would some people still grumble about the f if they did that and they called it Death Watch like we talked about? Would some people still grumble about that? Oh, absolutely. Of course, of course. But I think the majority of people would understand that they want to try something different, and that and that's what they're doing with this. Yeah, it would be an understanding that this isn't going to be a grand war game. This is going to be something more focused on a Death Watch squad. And the reason why I'm why I'm leaning in that direction is it's very clear they wanted to do something that that had a that had a smaller scale and a smaller, tighter focus. Yeah. And I th I think in I think instead of doing that and going half seas, they should have um go gone all in on it. Is the lesson I think the ultimate lesson when it comes to the when it comes to the Dawn of War games is when you try and please everyone, you please no one. Yes. It's the same reason we tell all the people who want easy mode and Dark Souls and other types of their games that not not every game is made for everyone. Uh, I do find I one of these days I will talk about how the um goal how the goalpost of that easy mode argument has shifted over the last three years. Still continuing to shift, but that's a different story. Mm -hmm. And for and for me personally, I've I've always said I'm not going to respect the easy mode argument because no because nobody can, nobody has a real idea on how you'd implement it without de without altering the experience. Mm -hmm. Not to mention that the accessibility argument is complete bullshit. There have been plenty of people who are cripples, and I'm going to use that word because they use that word. Fuck y'all. Uh, who, either through sheer determination or maybe a specialized controller, because that specialized controller thing, again, was introduced from Xbox, mm -hmm. um, were able to beat these games on very hard difficulties or with very shit builds. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, uh, and, um, even, and as I, as I've stated before, nothing nothing is made for everyone. Yeah, you cannot make everything for everyone. Gaming is a hobby everyone can enjoy, but not every game will be for everyone. Mm -hmm. But I'd say that I'd say that is as good. Well, one might one might ask why we'd bring why we'd bring up something like the Souls games in something like this. That's because that easy mode thing of of making it more accessible so that so that it can be for everyone. Is the exact thing that kind of doomed um, Dawn of War. It was. It wasn't trying to be easy in the form of accessibility, but it was trying to cater to two different playstyles that don't mesh. Mm-hmm. 
different path, but same result. And mm -hmm. I think that's as good of a I think that's as good of a coda that you, that we will ha that we will have for the for the for this particular endeavor. Um, we will be back tomorrow night with something brand spanking new that we are calling the Parliament of Geeks. Be be weeb or be scrub. So please look forward to that when the when the time comes, and I'll be having a few interviews with some familiar and and less familiar less familiar folks here in the temple. And of course, next week we'll be back with something also video game related. <laughs> so, as as the as the as um Yoshi P would say, please look forward to it. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, and join the watch.